Hi everybody, in this video we're looking at the Hardy-Weinberg principle or the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium which is a way of looking at um, allele frequencies in a population to decide whether or not the population is evolving. Okay, so our Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium what we have to do is we have to look at the allele frequencies in a particular population. So in the first generation of the population what we have here, this represents our gene pool so we're going to look at just one gene. Now, when we say gene pool, um, that actually means all of the alleles of all of the genes of all of the individuals in a population. Um, but usually we, we would only pick one of those genes which we're interested in looking at to see if that gene um, is evolving in terms of the frequency of the alleles rather than looking at all of the genes, which is just too difficult. So in this situation, we're going to look at a gene which has, um, it has to have a recessive and a dominant allele. In this case I've used the letter D. So here you can see there are two recessive alleles and if we were to look at all of the alleles in this population this, uh, this is what we would see. So there are uh, 10 individuals in this population therefore there are 20 alleles and we can see that there are one, two, three, four of the dominant alleles in this population. And that means that if we look at the frequencies four out of 20 alleles gives a frequency of 0 0.2 for the dominant allele um, and therefore we have 16 of the recessive alleles out of 20 so the frequency of the recessive allele is 0 0.8 so 20% of the alleles are dominant and 80% of the alleles are recessive. If we look at the same population, so the same gene pool in the second generation, so once this first generation has all reproduced. If we find that the population has got the same allele frequencies that it has before, so if we count these up we see again that the dominant allele has a frequency of 0 0.2 and the recessive has a frequency of 0 0.8. There has been no change in the allele frequencies from the first generation to the second generation. If this happens, if there is no change in the allele frequencies, then we say this population for this gene is at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Equilibrium means balance. So there's been no change in the allele frequencies. So this population for this particular gene is not evolving. So that's what the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium means. Um, but how do we calculate it? And is it likely that we would see populations in the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? So, if populations in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium are not evolving, that means, as we've said, that evolution is a change in allele frequencies. So, it would look something like this. In our first generation, here is our gene pool. So, this time, if we look at our allele frequencies, uh, we have a frequency of 0.5 for our dominant allele and 0.5 for our recessive allele. So um, we've got 50% of each in this population in our first generation. And if we then looked at our second generation, we can see visually here that there's obviously been a change. And when you calculate it, you can see that the frequency of D has gone down from 0.5 to 0.2, and the frequency of uh, sorry big D and the frequency of little D, the recessive allele, has gone up from 0.5 to 0.8. Now you would do some statistical analysis on this to compare it, uh, to compare the frequency of the two generations, but we can see here that there has been a change. That means that this population is not at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. The allele frequencies have changed. Now the other thing we can do, instead of saying uh, using the letter D and using a capital D, we can use a P, and P just represents the dominant allele. So it doesn't matter what gene we're looking at in any population, we can just use the letter P to represent whatever that dominant allele is. And then we can use the letter Q to represent the recessive allele in any situation. And what we can see is that P plus Q equals 1. And it must be because we've only got two alleles, one dominant and one recessive. In any gene pool, you must have a total of 1. 100% of the alleles are the recessive and dominant added together. So whether or not a population is evolving, P plus Q will always equal 1. And we can use this equation 
to help us calculate these things, which we'll look at a bit later. Okay, so we need to calculate allele frequencies, but it's actually quite hard to do that, and that's why we need to use some mathematical equations. And the reason it's hard to calculate allele frequencies is because we don't see alleles. Um, we don't see what's going on when you look at an individual, you just see the phenotype. So if we take as an example um, a population of moths, so we're going to be looking at the gene for the colour. So this moth is dark, and if you were to look at the DNA for this moth, for this particular gene, you'd see that it has two dominant alleles. So the letter D I use because I've represented the capital D to mean dark. So this is a homozygous dominant individual. But of course, you can get the same phenotype of dark colouring if you have a heterozygous individual. And you can't see that just by looking at the individual. All we see is two dark moths. If we have a recessive phenotype, we do, however, know that that recessive phenotype must have two recessive allele, <coughs> excuse me, alleles. So if we were to look at the whole population, and here we're showing the alleles, but we're showing them as the whole genotype. So this is an individual, this is an individual, and so on. You can see that if we look at the genotypes, then we can straight away work out how many of each allele there are. But in reality, we don't see those genotypes. All we see are the phenotypes. So we need to have a way of being able to go from the phenotypes that we see to being able to calculate the genotypes that we've got and therefore the allele frequencies. So because we only see the phenotypes, it's hard to calculate allele frequencies and also it's hard to calculate genotype frequencies. We don't see them. We have to work out what they are. OK, so how do we do that? It's all about probabilities, really. So if we take two, uh, free, so what we've got here, we've got a chromosome. And here's the gene locus for the, uh, the gene that we're looking at, so this gene for the moth's um, colour. So each individual will have two chromosomes, one which is inherited from each parent. And what we can see here, this is our gene pool with all of the alleles. And it's sometimes likened to the idea of a bag of marbles. So all, each allele is a marble, and when um, individuals reproduce, one of the alleles is removed from the bag and is um, given to the, the offspring. So in terms of probabilities, it's about what the likelihood is that a big D or a little d will be taken out of that gene pool bag of marbles. So if the first allele that is taken out is a recessive allele, the chance of that happening, if we look at our frequency of alleles in the gene pool, in this example here, there's an 80% chance of taking out a recessive allele because the frequency of the recessive allele in this gene pool is 80% or 0 0.8. So the chance of having another recessive allele is also 80%. They're independent events. Therefore, the chance of getting a genotype of little d, little d, so the chance of getting a homozygous recessive genotype is 0 0.8 multiplied by 0 0.8. If we were to take an allele and that allele was a dominant allele, then in this example there's a 20% chance, or 0 0.2. That's the frequency of our dominant alleles. So the likelihood of inheriting the genotype, which is small d, big D, small d, big D, is 0 0.8 multiplied by 0 0.2. If you inherited two of the dominant alleles. There's a 20% chance of inheriting it on this chromosome and there's a 20% chance of inheriting it on this chromosome. So the chance of getting a homozygous dominant genotype in this example is 0 0.2 times 0 0.2. And then because we have two chromosomes and you can inherit, um, if, you, if you're a heterozygous, you can either inherit the small d on this one and the big d on this one, but you can also do it the other way around. You have to include both possibilities. So the last possibility 
is that we inherit a dominant allele here and a recessive allele here. So the chance of that genotype occurring is also 0 0.2 times 0 0.8. These are the same, but they are different. They're, they're inherited in different ways, so you have to include them twice. Um, we can do this by looking at a Punnett square as well. And if you do that, you will see that the genotype, which is heterozygous, appears twice in a Punnett square. Okay, so let's calculate all of these then. So um, remembering that we can use P to represent our dominant allele and Q to represent our recessive allele. So rather than using the specifics for this gene, we're going to turn this into our probabilities for any gene in any gene pool that we might want to look at. So the chance of getting our recessive um, genotype is Q times Q. So 0 0.8 is our uh, frequency for our recessive allele, which is Q. So we just substitute Q in, and that is also then Q squared. The chance of getting our homozygous dominant genotype is P times P, which is P squared. And for our heterozygotes, we substitute in P and we substitute in Q. And what we can see there is we've got two Qs and two Ps. And if we combine them together, we get 2PQ. This equation is used to calculate genotype frequencies in any gene pool. P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared. This equation is what we call the Hardy-Weinberg equation. So we used our allele frequencies which we, we, we know in this example to calculate uh, this equation to work out how it, how it works. But of course, in reality, we wouldn't know our allele frequencies, we would just know our phenotypes. But now that we've seen how this equation has come about, we could work backwards as well. So we could take our Heidi-Weinberg equation along with the equation P plus Q equals 1, and we can use it to calculate what the allele frequencies are. So instead of starting with our allele frequencies and working out our Hardy-Weinberg equation, we could start with our Hardy-Weinberg equation and work out our allele frequencies. And I'll show you a worked example of that in another video. Okay, so if we know that organisms that are at Hardy-Weinberg equil equilibrium are not evolving, and we know that, therefore, if we see a change in allele frequencies, that means that there is evolution. Then what can cause that, ha that to happen? What causes allele frequencies to change? What causes evolution in populations? So the first obvious example is natural selection. So if you have selection pressures, then advantageous alleles are more likely to be passed on to the next generation. So you will see a change in the allele frequencies. Mutations are how new alleles arise. So if there's a mutation and we have a new allele which wasn't there before, then obviously we have a change in allele frequencies because we suddenly have a totally new allele. Non-random mating is um, it's a little bit like natural selection, but it's, it's, it's mate choice. So if you have a situation where the females of a population, maybe they prefer, in our moth example, if females preferred the um, colouring of the white moths for some reason, then they are going to choose those white moths to mate with, and the white colour is more likely to be inherited, and those recessive alleles are more likely to be passed to the next generation. But that's because of mate choice rather than because of any selection pressure. So, But it could still cause a change in allele frequencies. So they're not mating randomly. The females are choosing to mate with individuals which have one particular phenotype um, over another. Migration or gene flow. So any time a population is not isolated from another population, you'll have individuals entering and leaving the population, which means that they bring um, their alleles or they leave with their alleles. And that can cause a change in the frequency of alleles you've got. And finally, we've got genetic drift.
So genetic drift is also covered in another video and this is the idea of the founder effect, the population bottlenecks. This is chance effects on a population which can cause a change in allele frequencies. So in our moth example, maybe there is a fire in the wood where this population lives and by chance a large number of dark moths happen to be killed. That could cause a change in the allele frequencies just by chance. Genetic drift has a much greater effect on very small populations. Now the important thing here, if these all cause the allele frequencies to change and these are all causes of evolution, then that means that if you have populations which are undergoing any of these, they cannot be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is when allele frequencies are not changing. So for that to happen, there has to be no natural selection. There have to be no mutations. We have to have random mating. There has to be no mutations and there has to be no genetic drift. Only if all of those are true will you have a population that is not evolving and therefore a population that is in the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So to get a population in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is actually um, very unusual because one of these things will normally be taking place. Okay, that's all quite complicated stuff. I hope that makes sense. As I said, there is going to be another video showing you a worked example of how to do these calculations. Okay, thanks. Goodbye.